are starting a new Wednesday night class that, Lord willing, will take us to warmer weather by the time that we are done. It should uh, take us through the end of March, and we hope that it is warmer then. But this is a three-month study that will take us through the book of Daniel, and hopefully you've had the opportunity in our theme booklets that we made available online and this past Sunday to see where we're headed, not only this quarter, but throughout the year. We're taking a long, rich journey through God's Word, through biblical history this year, and that journey is going to start in the book of Daniel here in just a few moments. We're glad that you're here. The material is available online. Lesson one is available just outside of the doors there. Also lesson number two for next Wednesday evening. We'll get into our study here in just a moment, but before we begin, let's bow together and have a word of prayer, please. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you as the most awesome being in all of the universe. We praise you as the God of victory, the God who has empowered so many men and women of faith to victory down through the ages. You are the God who is, is mighty and powerful in creation, but also working behind the scenes. We praise you for your providence, for your great plan that has unfolded, that we might have access to you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. We thank you for your word that documents so much of this incredible history for us. And we pray that your blessing would be on us this evening as we go back to the great book of Daniel. Be with us as we study. Help our hearts to be shaped and encouraged and to be ready to give reasons for the hope that we have. We pray that in the midst of a difficult world, we would make the choice to be faithful to you above all else and help us to learn more and more each day that you rule in the kingdoms of men and that being a citizen in your kingdom is what matters most. We thank you that we're able to offer our prayer to you because of Christ, because of his triumphant resurrection from the dead. And it is in his name that we pray this evening. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 1 is where we're going to get kicked off. We've got 13 weeks to take us through this book, but we want to spend just a little bit of time thinking about where this falls in history. Obviously, there's a lot going on on this timeline. If you'd like to look at it in greater detail later on, I can give you a copy of it. But you see over to the left of the timeline, Genesis, the creation of man, the fall of man, flood all of those things into the period of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, taking us to the period of the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the giving of the law, eventually to Joshua, the children of Israel coming into the promised land. Once in the promised land, we have a period of judges ending with Samuel and eventually leading to the period of the kings. Of course, we've got the United Kingdom with Saul, David, and Solomon, and then we've got a divided kingdom. And you see how many books are written during this period of the kings, especially a lot of history and a lot of prophets. As God's people are turning away from God and forgetting the covenant that they had entered into all the way back here in the days of Exodus, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet, and they refuse to listen. Finally, of course, God allows the northern kingdom of Israel, first of all, to be carried away, and then eventually the southern kingdom of Judah. Even in exile, there are prophets. Jeremiah, his size of a book, also the author of Lamentations. This is where we find our book for the quarter, Daniel. After the days of Saul, David, and Solomon, after the, uh, or toward the end of the days of the united, or the divided kingdom, I should say, this is where Daniel and Ezekiel do their prophesying. 
Finally, recently on Sunday nights, Nathan Matthews walked us through much of the book of Nehemiah. This is where Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther fall, as some of God's people are allowed to come back, ultimately leading to a period of silence from God and ushering in the age of the New Testament. If we zero in on the kings themselves, we mentioned the United Kingdom, Saul, David, and Solomon that we read so much about of in First and Second Samuel, first kings leading to of course after Solomon a division in the kingdom to the north Jeroboam to the south Rehoboam and from Jeroboam we have a whole lot of very 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 wicked kings in the south we've got some wicked kings some better kings and that is precisely why according to God as we go further along the timeline the kingdom of Judah is allowed to stand longer the northern kingdom of Israel comes to an end in 722 BC 700 years before Jesus Christ uh, the Assyrian captivity Assyria comes in and blots Israel off of the map for a while Judah continues for instance you see Hezekiah a very righteous man who shows up in the days of Isaiah but we know eventually Judah also falls we've got some wicked some righteous men but the reason that we flow through this and come to right around 600 BC is because of this man Jehoiakim we're going to read his name here in just a minute in Daniel chapter 1 the very very beginning you see where we are about 600 years before Jesus Christ in the book of Daniel we're going to be introduced of course to the Babylonians who eventually give way to the Persians who give way to the Grecians who give way to the Romans who eventually of course are the ruling empire when Jesus steps on the scene. Hopefully that gives us a good frame of reference as to where we are in biblical history. We're in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1. You begin reading there with me. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So here he is. Third year of this man's reign, king of Judah. When we talk about the third year of that reign, we would equate that with 605 B.C. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this southern kingdom. Remember, of course, Israel at this point is no longer a sovereign nation. Judah still exists for a little while. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And we take a giant step back on the world map. Here in relatively small detail is the, the kingdom of Judah, the capital city of Jerusalem. But they are by no means the big dog on the block. That is Babylon. In years past, Egypt was a major player, but now Babylon has subdued what we learned of in school as the Fertile Crescent, right? Nebuchadnezzar is the great king. He reigns over here in Babylon. Just as a side note, a little south and east, you see what we believe would have been the Kabar Canal. That's where Ezekiel is. Okay, so Daniel and his companions are going to be up here. Ezekiel a little to the south and to the east. Jehoiakim is reigning over here in Jerusalem, but Babylon is the ruling empire. Nebuchadnezzar, according to Daniel chapter 1, comes to the city of Jerusalem. He besieges the city of Jerusalem, and of course, the centerpiece of all of that is the temple. That has been standing since the days of Solomon, an absolutely incredible structure. And Daniel is giving us all of these markers so that we know exactly what's going on and the tragedy behind all of this. Once more, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. We asked in our material, something very pivotal has just been communicated. 
that we want to make sure we have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that understand because Daniel wants us to understand. What do you make of this second verse? The idea that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Why is that significant? Craig, go ahead. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was known that he was out there as being very full of himself. Okay. Um, and you see him humble later on so in one sense, uh, this is showing God's power. God okay. is who made this happen. God is the one who made it. All right. David? I was just going to say, going, going back all the way to Genesis, I mean, if God created three institutions that were the mm-hmm. one, the, the, uh, the home, nation, mm-hmm. and then the church. Mm-hmm. Well, from the very beginning, he created the nation. And he made control of all three of us. But he created and, and this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Okay. And so he's, uh, he's just laying out, you know, kind of the roadmap of how he's been saying these things and now it's being fulfilled. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's keep a marker there in Daniel chapter 1. Go back with me very quickly to Jeremiah chapter 7. We mentioned Jeremiah just a little while ago. Hopefully you had the opportunity to look at many of these scripture references. We'll notice just one. God had promised all the way back in the days of Moses. He had promised in Exodus. He had promised in Leviticus. He had promised in Numbers. He had promised in Deuteronomy. If you do not respect the covenant I have made with you, I will remove you from the land to which I am taking you. Even before he gives it to them, he warns them. If you do not respect this covenant, I will move you off of this land. Okay? That was a part of the covenant that they had entered into. They begin to slip away from that, and God sends all of these prophets. That third bullet point under the background section of our material, when God's prophets warned that Babylon was going to bring disaster, David has already brought it up. It wasn't anything ambiguous. God named Babylon. He named Nebuchadnezzar. He told them who exactly was going to come if you will not listen. And of course, they refused to. They they believed uh, that that there's no way this is going to happen. Just a small sample. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house, which is what? The temple, right? Stand in the gate of the temple and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord. All you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Whose place is this? It's not Israel's. It's not Nebuchadnezzar's. It's God's. If you amend your ways, I will allow you to be in this place. Verse 4, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. What were some saying, according to Jeremiah, in these days that were deceiving the people? Why say the temple of the Lord three times, do you think? Isn't that a little odd? Go ahead. Yeah. The temple's right here, right? This is God's house. Why would God, how would God allow a pagan king to come in and knock over this beautiful house? As long as we've got this house and as long as we've got the Ark of the Covenant in this house, everything is fine. And notice, just as has been the case all along, there are people who will tell other people, you don't need to worry about everything, you just 
just go ahead and live life the way that you want to live it, especially if there's some sort of benefit coming back to these deceptive prophets and spokesmen. There were those who, when they heard prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all of these other men, thought there is no way this is going to happen. Well, Daniel tells us historically it did happen. And he tells us ultimately whose mighty hand was behind it all. Not Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a major player on world history stage, right? But Daniel wants us to understand from the very beginning of this massive book, there is someone greater than Nebuchadnezzar who is working behind the scenes. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar with some of the vessels of the house of God. You think about that. Some of the things that had been crafted all the way back in the days of Solomon are raided and carried off to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And so he takes them from Jerusalem. If we were to go straight across, it's about 500 miles. He takes them more than 500 miles away, all the way back to Babylon. And he places those vessels in the, the uh, treasury of his God. History tells us what Nebuchadnezzar's God was called. Not only history, but also Isaiah and Jeremiah tell us that Nebo was the God of Nebuchadnezzar, the God, the major uh, deity of the Babylonians at this point in time. And interestingly enough, if you visit the British Museum today, you can see a massive uh, statue of Nebo. Uh, you see uh, ornamental things on the side, lots of Babylonian uh, archaeological things that you can see today. But this was Nebo. This was the god of Nebuchadnezzar and many of the Babylonians. Then Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us, The king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. People who are young, people who are, in the eyes of the king, well-bred people with potential, I'm going to bring them over. This is not an uncommon thing for ancient monarchs to do. The question is why? Why would these kings, when they deposed an entire nation of people, why would they take some of the cream of the crop and bring them back? What did they hope to accomplish, Shall it? What have I done? Okay. In a whole lot of respects, they're like living trophies, right? Look at what I have. Let me tell you where these men came from as a reminder of my great might. Andrew Wiles. To ensure for the next generation, when I, I will train you the way I want you to learn, and then I will release you back to your own people, yeah. you will have my ideologies, you will be my friend, and you will have my ways. You will be my ambassadors to the remnants of that country. My reign will grow because yeah. of that's yeah, absolutely. So we've got some of the royal family and of the nobility, young people that look good and they're pretty smart and they're endowed with knowledge, understand they're able to learn, that they, they won't be an embarrassment if they are in Nebuchadnezzar's palace, and we're going to teach them how the Chaldeans talk and how they read and so on and so forth. You imagine having left Jerusalem and being carried away to Babylon. Of course, we understand Babylon had one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens. It was an absolutely incredible 
place. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Here's what this has to do with our study of the Bible. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. These are the names more often than not that we recognize them by. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, especially these last three. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. There's a lot going on there even if we can't discern it in English. Daniel, his name in Hebrew, in the language of his people, meant God is my judge. And we will see as the book goes along how he lives up to that name. His name is changed to honor the wife of one of the Babylonian gods, Bel. Uh, it was a plea, his name was, that this wife of the god Bel would protect the king. Hananiah, whose name went, meant Yahweh is gracious, is changed to command of Aku, who was the Babylonian moon god. Mishael, whose Hebrew name asked the question, who is what God is, is changed to who is like this moon god. Azariah, Yahweh is a helper, is changed to servant of Nebo, servant of the shining one that we referenced earlier. What is this monarch and his people hoping to do even by changing the names of these young men? What's that all about? Do you think? Why do something like that? Blink? Yeah, for one, why should you continue to praise a God that in Nebuchadnezzar's mind I'm greater than, right? If this God of the Hebrews was greater than me, I wouldn't have been able to knock over this temple and desecrate this city that had stood for so long. Andrew? Psychological conditioning for the future training. Yeah. Changing everything about them, right? Changing the way that they eat, changing the way that they talk, changing the way that they live, changing the way that they prioritize and value things, and, and even the gods to whom they will be loyal. These four young Hebrew men are being completely assimilated into Babylonian lifestyle, and it is a three-year plan. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. We're not told specifically what it is about the king's delicacies that would defile Daniel, but we understand in no uncertain terms, he believes, I cannot do this and be pure in my service to God. Now, can't you hear the, the excuses and the rationalizations and the reasons just rattling around in your mind? So many people that you've known all your life, they're dead. Jerusalem is on the pathway to absolute destruction. The temple is at the very end. All of the glory that Solomon had, had fashioned, all of that is now passing into history. Uh, the, the people who are not dead are either judged completely unworthy of Nebuchadnezzar's attention, or they are now slaves. Of all the things to worry about, <coughs> isn't this something you could kind of fly under the radar on. I mean, you know, Joseph, for instance, well, there's a, a sexual immorality issue with Potiphar's wife. But why even this? Why take it this far? Why not just mellow out a little? After all, you have survived. What's going on here, Alice? How many of us can say do you have the strength and conviction they don't have here to live in Everything else yeah. in his name to say, I will keep it under control of one thing I do have control over, and that's my relationship with God. Yeah, yeah. 
This is a ruthless man, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we, we reference in the material for next week. If you don't think that he was ruthless, uh, we provide a, a, a reference to what he does to King Zedekiah in, in just a few years from now. He, he gets Zedekiah in Jerusalem. He gets all of Zedekiah's children together and he murders Zedekiah's children in front of his own eyes and then he gouges Zedekiah's eyes out and leaves him in chains to Babylon. This is a ruthless, ruthless man. This is not a man known for his compassion, either in the Bible or in history. And so we're dealing with a great deal of courage. What else stands out to you, Jason? Why take it this far? Almost because you have nothing left. Okay. That's the only thing he has left, is done. And if he can give that up, then there's no point in him surviving. Yeah, yeah. Anything else, Craig? Go ahead. You know, well, you see throughout the book, his commitment to God and what God had asked of him. It was not about to turn one way or the other. He got about to look at this and say, and then he was saying, well, this is just too. It's not that yeah. big a deal. It really a lot of ideas for us today. We think about saying what God did. Paul? Oh. It establishes his character yeah. for the future. Because this is going to come back to prove fruitful to him was never been ever longer yeah. after down the line. So this just saying this is my priority in life, this is who my trust and put my faith in, I'm not going to change my character for nothing. Yeah. And what I want us to see from the very beginning, this is an old book. Yes. Very, very old book. But the tension that is here is just as real today as it was then. Circumstances are different. But this book, all over the book, from beginning to end, is the opportunity and the pressure to compromise. Here are people who are in exile. They don't belong there. They have been put there and they are different. They stand out, especially when they pull stuff like this. They really stand out. There is great pressure to compromise. It's going to be over and over and over again. In Daniel chapter 1, it's food. In Daniel chapter 2, what is it? Do you remember? It's this giant statue. And every time you hear the music play, what are you expected to do? Bow down before the statue. It's escalated, hasn't it? But you notice, if you compromise here, are you more likely to compromise in Daniel chapter 2? By the time we get with Daniel as a very old man, it is the king has passed the law. If you pray to any god other than the gods that Babylon has sanctioned, you will be thrown in a den of lions. Very real pressure to compromise as exiles, as pilgrims, as strangers. And what we see from the very beginning is Daniel and his friends are men of resolve. It is not popular. It was not popular then, guess what? Increasingly in our own country. It is not popular to be men and women of strong resolve. More and more and more do we not see that. that uh, there are great societal pressures and one of the worst things you can do is speak out when everybody else is just going along with what is deemed politically correct. Here, uh, on relatively small things, in the grand scheme of things, according to our own human reasoning, it's just food, right? Is the temptation to compromise. But if you compromise here, where is it going to stop? Matt, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Seems like it's also important since it's the first time we're working with a chance to set a finished first impression. Sure. How important that is. Sure. And we see the power of that as this goes along. He asks this chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Again, we are being encouraged to read between the lines, are we not? 
God sees Daniel willing to stand up even when it's difficult, even when he's going to stand out. God sees Daniel courageously asking to be exempted from this, and God is working behind the scenes. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youth who all your own age so you would endanger my head with the king then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the units had assigned over Daniel Hedonai and Mishael and Azariah test your servant for ten days let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. We're going to see that over and over again throughout the book of Daniel. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah therefore they stood before the king and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Again, to you and me, on the surface, that doesn't mean a, a, a whole lot, but what is being communicated is, for the next 60 plus years, this is where Daniel is. Daniel is going to go from being a very young man to an old man in Babylon. And he is going to see Nebuchadnezzar rise and Nebuchadnezzar fall. He's going to see the glory of Babylon and he's going to be there and prophesy the night that Babylon gives way to the Medes and to the Persians. Let me ask you, let's open our Bibles back to Proverbs chapter 3. We asked the question there at number 4 in the material, how was the resolve of these young men a living answer to the call of Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. We referenced this on Sunday morning as one of the steps to victory. We, we acknowledge that we are helpless without God and we believe that He is and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him and we trust in what He has accomplished and what He is achieving and what He will ultimately secure. And so wisdom tells us in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. How do Daniel and his three young companions show us in full living color what that really is all about, you think? Alex, go ahead. Verse 7 Yeah. Fear the Lord and turn away from the Lord. Daniel feared the Lord to trust in God's understanding rather than his own, and he turned away from the Lord and made it for them. And he, as well as his companions, were rewarded for that involvement. Okay. Eric? I'm going to look at the opposite, right? So if they had to leave on their own understanding, presented in a situation, Daniel would have said, based on my own understanding, without faith in God. Well, I'll just go along with it, and then, you know, over the course of time, maybe I can make it a big hit for the name of the name. Yeah. And in reality, we can work things through, which is what it is, which is what it is. Okay. Dwayne? I think it's human nature sometimes, too, to send things for a way in the wrong time. 
It's a phrase that keeps getting thrown around in our media, isn't it? Right, but you sit there and you think about it, and so here where the Jewish people, um, you know, years and years and years moved from actually walking with God, being with God in Exodus, and, mm-hmm. and so, you know, they're being told these tales by their grandparents and their grandparents and being passed along poorly, and next thing you know, you know, this God that they're serving, uh-oh, wait a minute, we're supposed to be serving this God, why are we being led into exile? And yeah. so the, the self-doubt, we start to, the, you can start to look at your current situation and start to say, am I serving the right God? Am I doing the things that I need to do? If, if we look at our overall life and just that microcosm of the thing, and I just let away the captivity, how is God going to do this? Yeah. Start throwing that meat in for you. And what if it's going to be, you know, say, uh, according to my own understanding, apparently I threw my lot into the wrong God. Yeah. If ever there was a time and a circumstance to believe I'm on the wrong side, surely it would be tempting to believe that in this moment. Andrew? I think the way uh, Daniel expresses his resolve mm-hmm. is also uh, an indication of not leaning on his own understanding. I, I think it's a significant lesson. He didn't just, he resolved. That yeah. He, in his mind, he made up what he was going to do. But then he wasn't belligerent. He didn't draw a line in the sand. He didn't say, you can't make me eat. He went to the guy that was running the show in his situation, and he asked. He put his faith that I will, I'll behave myself, but I will bring this up to the proper authorities. I will trust that God will let go of the way did, and God did. God's the one that directed the human. Yeah. Daniel did not direct that human. Yeah. Look, look, just to illustrate your point, go back with me to Daniel. And we're going to notice something about Daniel that Andrew has brought up, and it is a very important point. We see it here in Daniel chapter 1. Look at Daniel chapter 2. And we'll notice that more of the circumstances later on. This is right with Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is not happy. And when Nebuchadnezzar is not happy, people die. All right, so that's just how that goes. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 14, Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. That's beautiful. Let's just make sure we understand what it means. What does it mean? In in this instance, we'll see it in Daniel 2, we'll see it on more than one occasion. When you reply with prudence, in the midst of a very volatile situation. What does that mean? Sharon? You can do anything to antagonize them, okay. to put them on the defensive. Okay. It's very hard to reason with anyone when they feel that they're being threatened. They'll, they'll get angry and, and they don't listen to what you say. So by being, um, and I like do use the wisdom of the past. Yeah. Um, to be tactful with that and approaching it in a calm, organized manner. Right. Uh, he was able to get them to do what he wanted. Sure, sure. Just because the world is on fire around you doesn't mean that you lose your head and you lose your moral compass, right? And you forget who you are and, and whose you are. Ken, did you have your hand raised? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. He was under control. Yeah. He is under control. It's a difficult situation, right? And, and life is literally on the line on more than one occasion, but he's under control. Ultimately, because he trusts in the Lord with all of his heart. We'll hear his three companions in Daniel chapter 2 who say, we believe, Nebuchadnezzar, that God is going to deliver us from you. But, just because we believe it doesn't mean that He will. Even if He will not understand, we're not going to compromise. That is great strength. But it is wise strength. Right? There is a time to be like a hammer and there is a time to be like a surgeon's knife. Right? And prudence and insight or wisdom and tact is the maturity and the, the ability to wield my own inner man or woman. Right? Any, any other thoughts along those lines? Andrew? Um, along the lines, God beats the Babylonians at their own game. They kidnap these kids, they're going to give them an education. 
And sure enough, the way God blesses these poor is he makes them the scholars. Yeah. He, everything that the Babylonians wanted, that's what they became. They're experts in the math, the literature, the, everything they wanted to teach, they learned. And God, they leaned on God to understand. Yeah. And so they excelled. They did exactly what the Babylonians wanted, and it backfired on them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go back. Uh, it's a it's an incredibly important point. Go back with me to Psalm two. It, it was the closing thought here, and I hope on the back side of this lesson one you noticed the pattern, uh, because Daniel is a powerful, powerful testament to the ability and the sovereign nature of God, right? You, you just look at the way that we subtitled these lessons on the back, the, the table of contents or our schedule. Daniel 1, the God who works behind the scenes. Daniel 2, the God who establishes his kingdom. Daniel 3, the God who delivers. Daniel 4, the God who rules the kingdom of men. Daniel 5, the, king, the God in whose hand is your breath. Daniel 6, the God who rescues. Daniel 7, the God who judges. Daniel 8, the God who bestows and breaks power. Daniel 9, the God who sees, hears, and acts. Daniel 10, the God who wins the ultimate victory. Daniel 11 and 12, the God who reigns over history. Hopefully when we approach Daniel from this point of view, you'll see that it's a good way to set the table for our entire focus for the year, right? Victory belongs to God. You've seen, hopefully, on the calendar, you've seen on the marquee outside, we could say, and we will say on Sunday morning, you can summarize the Bible in just two words. God wins. I'll use more than two words on Sunday, but we'll continue to come back to those two words over and over and over again. That's the theme, right? God wins. That's the theme of Daniel. We're going to spend two quarters, Lord willing, in the, the spring and in the summer going through the book of Revelation. Intimidating book, right? But the big theme in just two words is Jesus wins. And society may try and tell Daniel then, it may try and tell us now, you're just ignorant, you're just pig-headed, you're just uh, old-fashioned, you're just archaic, you're on the wrong side of history. But here's the fundamental truth that Daniel is teaching us and Revelation is teaching us in so many other books. God is going to win. We want to be on His side. Psalm 2. You read that with me and we'll end here. Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? It's a great way of describing Nebuchadnezzar as we're going to see in Daniel. The kings of the earth set themselves... And the rulers take counsel together. We will listen to Nebuchadnezzar as he says in Daniel, Is this not great Babylon which I have built? We will listen in on Babylonian kings and princes and rulers uh, throwing a party while the Medes and the Persians are outside of Babylon because they believe there is no way we can be overthrown. We will hear in the prophets off and on throughout this quarter how there were alliances with Egypt and there were alliances with Syria and there were alliances with Lebanon. And surely if we align with the right people, then we'll, we will be in control of our own destiny. Psalm 2 simply says, The kings of the earth set themselves... The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. God hears. God sees everything. Three different times we were given little hints in Daniel chapter 1. The Lord is behind all of this. And when the Lord sees mighty men acting as if no one is greater than themselves. I can do this and God will not see. I can do this and God will not care. I can do this and, and there will be no repercussions. God sees, God hears, God laughs. And God holds them in derision. God knows exactly what they have done. 
and at the right time they will be called to give an account for what they have done. In two words, the book of Daniel is all about God wins. But it's up to us, even in the little aspects, the littlest details of life, to be people of courage and conviction and to do the right thing no matter what. I appreciate you being here this evening, definitely.